it all started for me when uh, I first picked up a bike um, to do more than just go down the end of the street. Um, when I came to Australia, a mate of mine said that he was going to um, ride the Around the Bay in a day, which is a, a 250 kilometer bike ride. Um, I hadn't been on a bike longer than about 10 minutes at that point, so um, thinking that it was about going to take about eight hours um, it was a bit of a shock. Um, so I started training with my mates. Um, they were all drinking sports drinks, and um, uh, I started too as well. Um, it wasn't after a while that um, I uh, started to take it a little bit more seriously. I started to ride quite frequently. I was doing about 300 k's a week. Um, when another mate came up to me and said that he was looking to raise money for a, a children's charity, um, the children's uh, Starlight Children's Foundation, it's called, and. Um, Basically we had a, uh, <laughs> a ride plan from Sydney to Melbourne and I said to him, well, you know, you know that's, that's about a thousand k's, uh, that'll take us about a week, I, I've got two weeks worth of leave, you know, where's another thousand k's up the road and um, so we ended up doing it from Brisbane to Melbourne, so that was 14 days, uh, 2,000 k's um, and that was like one of the best trips I've ever had, you know, um, just me and my mates. And I suppose the thing was that just before we, we took that um, trip, uh, we met up with a, uh, a nutritionist um, who said that um, you know we should be looking into our nutrition plan and need to make sure we're eating enough carbohydrates and uh, make sure we're getting enough electrolytes into us um, and, and make sure we're hydrating appropriately. So she wrote out this plan, and as part of that plan, we were drinking about uh, a liter of, of sports drink um, per hour, give or take, because some of the some of the times you're riding at about 40 degrees Celsius. So um, we just followed the plan, um, bought big tubs of this powdery stuff. Um, by the time I got back to Melbourne, um, we uh, I had a, a dental appointment booked at the time, and basically uh, went in from a routine uh, dental appointment, which was you know annually, um, and I'd been seeing the same dentist. Um, in the city for about four years at the time, and um, he he basically said he says you know what what the hell have you done to your teeth? And I was like what do, what do you mean? And he says um you, they look shocking like have you been have you been looking after your teeth? And I said yeah I've been, I'm brushing them every day and every night and flossing as as usual. He said no something's changed. Um, and I was telling him about my bike ride, and he said you know have you been drinking sports drinks? And I said yeah we've been drinking. I was drinking about four four liters of it a day and he said you, you gotta stop drinking it. Uh, at that point I didn't really understand why, I kinda thought it was about the sugar but I knew I was brushing my teeth and it was fine. He said no, it's, if you're brushing your teeth it, that's only half the problem, the other problem is the, the, the acid that's in those kinds of drinks. And um, I, I started to ask him more questions because I, didn't, I couldn't believe that something that I was drinking that was recommended by a doctor was actually so bad for my teeth that I had to stop drinking it. And I suppose that's where the whole process started for me, where I started to understand that, that yeah, these healthy kind of drinks are really bad for you. Um, so he put me on to a guy that um, was doing a lot of research up at the University of Melbourne, a, a guy called uh, Nathan Cochran. And um, I started to read into a lot of the, the research that he'd done um, about the pH of drinks, so the, the acidity of drinks, and um, what effect that they have on the teeth and also that the lower the pH that those drinks are, the more uh, likely uh, that they'll cause uh, dental erosion. Um, and it turns out that that's what I was suffering from, so the enamel on my teeth was actually being demineralized by really strongly acidic sports drinks. Um, and yeah, I suppose that's where it started for me, from going on a, um, a trip, doing what I love, riding a bike, um, doing what the doctor told me, and doing what a nutritionist told me to do, um, and ended up with, you know, many dental trips um, to fix a lot of the work or at least stop and prevent any further damage being caused to my teeth. Um, like fixing fillings that were about to fall out. Um, you know, really expensive stuff. A lot of the drinks that were produced, a lot of the sports drinks and even the soft drinks as well were, were sitting with a pH of around anywhere between 2.3 and 3.3. Um, and the more I started to learn about what I should have been listening to in, in high school was the, the pH scale and, and actually that each pH level is 10 times um, uh, more, more corrosive or, or more acidic. 
Um, from then, I started to understand that some of these drinks were, you know, nearly a thousand times more acidic than than what your teeth could actually um, withstand. Um, and beyond that, they start to become um, eroded. And it was really, I suppose, the biggest thing for me was 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 that was that shock. But also, um, I, I couldn't believe that um, this all this research had been done. This like hundreds of articles had been written about er the erosive potential of drinks and yet me as somebody who was drinking these drinks didn't know anything about them. Um, so I started to look around at that, at that point because I knew I needed the carbohydrates and the electrolytes and I knew I needed to hydrate um, because I'd been there before without having those drinks and it's not a great place to be. Um, and looked around in the market and I couldn't actually find anything like I went online, um, went into the shopping centre, looked at all the papers and all of them had drinks that were quite erosive. Um, so I started to meet up with um, some food technologists and some uh, sports um, nutritionists um, and physicians um, who, who were talking about what's, what's actually required in a sports drink, so the, the energy that you need, uh, the, the, the electrolytes that are required by the body, what it can tolerate. Uh, before you get a gastrointestinal upset um, and then started to play with um, uh, a formula if you like that didn't have the acid content in it that would actually cause your teeth to erode but still had all the ingredients that you need to um, to get the performance and, and hydration that you need from a sports drink. And I suppose the crazy thing was that uh, you know, I'd, I'd done a little bit of reading into science, but the more I got into it, the more I kind of got geekishly fascinated with it. Um, all of the detail um, that was that was present there, and I started that I couldn't I couldn't actually believe that they had these scientific research. These guys at university had taken these products directly off the shelf, brought them into their lab, mixed them up to the required quantities as per the manufacturer's specifications. Um, put them against human dental enamel and then read the, the, the step changes in, in the uh, hardness of that enamel over time and published this on a public forum so you can go on the internet and find these papers so these companies know that their drink causes these problems with human teeth yet <laughs> they're not doing anything about it and that, that's, that's what's really scary so there are companies out there who would go to any measure to protect their profits um, because really what they use the acid for is to preserve it on the shelf for as long as possible um, and to generate this really intense flavor that um, they've gotten people to get used to over, over time it's yeah I just it, it it's um, you just I just can't believe that they know it yet they're not willing to do anything about it to change um, their to change their product to make it better to make it healthier Yet they market it as a as a healthy product. Really, to get that that first batch going, it was it's it's quite expensive. The the research and development side of things is, um, you know, it's expensive stuff. Uh, so I had a um, bit of a DNM with um, with my wife, and uh, we decided that once we sold our home, that we would use the whatever money we had left over and, and invest it in um, in sake. Uh, so really, it was a big leap of faith. Um, from me and my wife's perspective because I was really excited about it she was too but you got to be really really excited to put the money from your house into something so um, we we got the first batch going and, and since then I haven't looked back and I remember the um, the first time I got the, the package back from the food technologist the guys that we'd pulled together to, to develop um, the first tooth friendly formula <laughs> And it was just an amazing time, you know, um, to see the pH reading on it being a pH of five. That um, I knew that from the research that this was not an erosive product. Um, finally, getting it out, tasting it, um, going through a few iterations to refine the flavor and make sure it was really spot on. Um, and I suppose that's one of the challenges because we started from scratch. We didn't, we didn't want to use all the artificial colors and flavors and stuff like that. Like I wanted a drink that was for me that I was happy to put into my body um, and to get that finally and have a, the very first production run was really exciting. Um, I called up um, somebody that I met during racing for Cycling Victoria 
and say, guys, I've got this product and I want to roll, uh, run and roll it out. Um, I want to do it with one of your events. And um, we had our first event out in um, one of the country areas in Victoria. And I think there were about 500 people at this event, so uh, it was a relatively small event, but still talking to people and engaging with people and finally telling them that, hey, do you know what those other drinks do? Uh, this drink uh, does everything that they do, but it, it won't cause dental erosion. And um, the, the response that we got was fantastic. It really um, kicked me off because finally I was able to tell people, okay, that's, that's not good for you. And then actually say, well, here's, here's an alternative. Um, so that was, that was really exciting. And, and it kind of went from there. So we had that event. Um, my friends started drinking it. They really liked it. Um, we started, they started to tell more of their friends. We set up the online store. Um, we've got a couple of stores picking it up now. A lot of dentists recommend it, um, which is f fantastic, absolutely fantastic. Um, and yeah, so it's it's grown from there. We're starting to sell overseas now. Um, we get testimonials um, every week and people writing just about how much has changed. Um, uh, not only what they're doing on the when they're training, um, but um, also that that they've gone back to the dentist after five, ten years of having problems to, um, they don't have problems anymore, the dentist is saying that things have stabilized and you know, that, that stuff's just fantastic. You know, that really makes me feel um, uh, like I've really contributed something uh, that people really want. It's pretty awesome to, to, to know that you can bet your house on something that you feel other people want, or you can bet your house on something that, that you believe is, is better um, it's better for, for people's health um, and get it out there and people actually start to buy it. I suppose it's one of the things that really gets entrepreneurs going is to be able to create something and people start to buy it and love it. But the more people I meet when I'm, when I'm out, the more people that recognize the brand, um, the more people that feel confident to come up and, and talk to you when you're at, event, at events. Um, yeah, it's just it's, it's a great buzz. It's a great vibe. I love it. was from